We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level, can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. G'day guys, welcome back to the Mind Made podcast. It's been a very long time since I've recorded a show and uh, I suppose that's because there's been a couple of things going on and um, one of them is I've, I'm, I've gone back to uni to study psychological science and uh, you know, for those of you who've been following the show um, for a couple of years now, you know, I've been getting increasingly more interested in uh, research, you know, um, reading the lab reports, having a look at what um, psychologists um, and people in the academic fields are studying and, 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 and that which is the, the frontier of, you know, medicine and therapy and ideas around consciousness and, and who we are. And, uh, you know, because these are the people who are really going to be, you know, building and creating the paths for, uh, for clinicians in the years to come. Like what is the mind and how can we help people that are study that are struggling from neuroses and, and mental health issues, um, as well as how can we better build societies predicated on these findings? And, you know, these are the areas that I think I'm, I'm, I'm really getting involved with and, 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 and finding fascinating. And it's the area that I'd like to take the next stage of my life, I think, as well as, continuing to work with people from a, from a counseling perspective. Um, so there's been that. And also my third and final book, at least for the moment, <laughs> um, has, has been published echoes from the past, uncovering the subjectivity of traumatic events, cultivating self-awareness and transforming pain into purpose. And this, uh, episode today is actually chapter 16 from this book, which is all about relationships and, uh, it's called relationships are more like classrooms than honeymoons. And I'll give you a brief um, insight into to the book. It's, it's actually my biggest book um, out of all three. Um, there's five parts to it. And the way the, the book is layered is that parts one, two, and three is basically moving someone or, re- or the reader or the listener, if you, if you want to have a listen to the audio, um, through the subjectivity of trauma. And a big thing that I come across when I'm working with people in the counseling setting is there's a lot of shame surrounding, um, you know, some of the deepest and most painful aspects of their lives and these experiences because they compare them with people who are, um, or who, who, who are struggling from more objective, ideas of trauma, whether that be sexual abuse victims, um, war veterans, you know, car crashes, um, you know, cheating spouses, you know, these, these, these things that we all commonly perceive to be traumatic, you know, and people who are really struggling to move on with their lives inevitably find themselves comparing their own experiences to that and shaming themselves saying, I'm so weak because I can't get over it. It's not like I was sexually abused. It's not like I was, um, tortured in a, in a, in a concentration camp or whatever it is. And that shame is, is a very challenging thing to move through, not only from the clinical, the clinician's perspective, but also from the client's perspective, because it means that they, you know, perhaps they don't feel like they deserve to, um, to find the treatment that they, that they do deserve. So this book is all around trying to help people transcend that shame and then empower them to, take that first step towards becoming who they could be and moving on from pain that they they don't deserve to still be experiencing in the present moment. So part one is defense, defense. That's all about, um, you know, how subjective trauma manifests itself, you know, not only from a biological and evolutionary setting, how we're wired for this kind of thing, um, what suffering looks like, isolation, intrusive thoughts, um, you know, shadow ideas as well. If you're looking more into the unconscious side of things, um, 
part two is, is called the truth is both black and white. So some of the ways that you can start to open up and heal or just look into what actually might be holding you back or, or what actually might still be, you know, emotionally troubling for you. Um, part three is all about um, moving on. So beyond pain and pleasure, beyond the suffering. Um, there's a bit of spirituality in here too. Um, and, and the final chapter is called the healing journey in a nutshell. And from that part four and then part five, part five is even wider, but part four is awareness integration. So it's, it's actually some steps that you can actually take. And there's everything in here from practical skills to bring to relationships, the psychedelic experience, how journaling can really help, um, writing yourself a new story. So narrative therapy is involved in that, um, the, the, the class of life. And also this, this, this idea that I wanted to kind of debunk, um, uh, in the modern world, which is all about finding your purpose, you know, and I, and I call chapter 20, stop trying to find your purpose because life is all about creating a purpose, you know, and, and to be honest with you, the word purpose, I'm, I made a course around this, um, but there's so much baggage even to the word purpose and the word meaning and all these kinds of, um, you know, seemingly esoteric concepts that are actually very simple. And it's all just about, you know, for me anyways, um, and what seems to ha- to help with people that I, I chat to in the counseling space is, um, you know, writing a list of really meaningful goals for you. What would be a slightly better place for you to exist in six months from now? You know, you can get away from trying to find your purpose and build a life of meaning. You know, it's all it's more about being alive and 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 building a life that you're excited about. So. Part five then is is the political landscape. So I, I wanted to throw in a little chapter there. Um, it's called a philosopher's take on modern politics, and um, I hope you find that one enjoyable. But as I said today, guys, this episode is um, a chapter from the audio version of the book Echoes from the Past. It's called Relationships Are More Like Classrooms Than Honeymoons, and I feel that if people can start to view their relationships as classrooms, as ways to learn and grow and understand more about themselves and grow in union with their partners, um, they're, they're going to be able to remove that expectation that every Hollywood movie leaves us with, you know, with that final first kiss, that's going to be how a relationship is for the rest of our lives. And if it's not like that all the time, and if we're not always swimming in pleasure, then there's something wrong with us. Um, you know, trying to transcend that idea and then also coming to enjoy the process of growing and learning with the person you've decided to be with. That's what really makes relationships, um, prosper. And, um, you know, and that's not just my perspective, you know, the Gottman Institute, which is the leading, uh, evidence-based research institute on relationships. Um, a lot of their advice is pretty conducive to hopefully some of the stuff that I've written here in this chapter. Um, so I really hope you enjoy this one guys. As I said, my book, my third book echoes from the past is now out. Um, I'll officially have, um, pumped it up by August 6th and this podcast will already be out by then. Um, I think, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, it could be a day off there. Um, so you can, you can purchase a copy by jumping on Amazon. Um, the paperback version is a little more expensive than I would have liked to be, to be completely honest with you only because it is quite a thick book. So if you want to jump into it, but you don't really want to spend the money, um, a Kindle, uh, the Kindle option is a hell of a lot cheaper, or you can actually listen to the audio version for free if you download Audible and you'll get a free monthly credit there when you subscribe. So that's a much better option for you. Um, obviously, if you do like paperbacks, then I'm sincerely grateful if you do want to purchase the paperback copy. Um, you can have a look at what that looks like if you jump to my Instagram, tom.ahern. But uh, for now, guys, enjoy the episode. Bye. Chapter 16, why relationships are more like classrooms than honeymoons. I vividly remember an argument I had with my partner whilst on the way to a friend's house for dinner on a Sunday night. I have to preface this stream of consciousness with the fact that the fault of the argument lay humbly in my lap. At the time, however, I was happy to place the blame fervently in hers. My partner Siobhan had become a somewhat nervous passenger two years prior, ever since she endured a moped accident skidding on the wet roads in Bali. Although she was steering the bike, her anxiety pervaded all on-road situations thereafter. I, on the other hand, having avoided all injury in Bali, she was not so lucky, was, and became even more so, a complacent driver. (laughs) 
I wasn't dangerous, slow or lazy, but you could say I lacked care. Fast forward two years later, we were about to enter the freeway and in that moment, I thought it more important to peel back the wrapper surrounding my bar of Whitaker's coconut chocolate. Upon reflection, a reasonable conclusion inferred by observation of my actions was that the chocolate was more valuable than Siobhan's life. We drove over a pothole and Siobhan's anxiety rose faster than the chocolate bar to my mouth, leaving the palm of my sweaty hand. She lost it, and rightly so. Yet in that moment, the anger shield of armour protecting my embarrassment and humility thought to debate the competence of my driving. But the argument had nothing to do with the quality of my driving, at least not entirely. On the contrary, it had everything to do with how I'd made Siobhan feel in that moment, scared or uncared for. Even still, no words of apology were uttered from my mouth, and not a shred of empathy either, only anger and defensive debate. How could I concede defeat? I could not, so the anger barriers went up. Anger is a kind of weak armour that appears to protect us from the pain being inflicted by someone or something else, the external world. But the external world is a manifestation of our projected consciousness, and we cannot protect ourselves from ourselves. So why bother? When life gives us lemons, remember that we are simply giving ourselves lemons. We must learn to love the sour taste. So let's add a bit of sugar and dance with the world as though we are dancing with ourselves because we are. Anger then, or fear, because both fight or flight seek to combat or react to whatever has been encountered, is a shielding from the truth, even though the truth is precisely what is needed to learn, grow, and love. As David Data, the spiritual teacher and author of the best-selling The Way of the Superior Man writes, quote, surrendering means letting go of your resistance to the total openness of who you are. It means giving up the tension of the little vortex you believe yourself to be and realizing the deep power of the ocean you truly are. It means to open with no boundaries, emotional or physical, so you ease wide beyond any limiting sense of self you might have. I know why it is difficult not to be angry, not to put the walls up when defending our position appears to be a matter of life and death, especially when it is only too obvious that the fault was ours. Anger, like fear, is an attempt of the mind and body to remove itself from uncomfortable states of consciousness. But feeling into, as David Data would say, those uncomfortable states is precisely what is required to grow as individuals. We spend most of our lives trying to remove ourselves from unbearable states of consciousness, only to run toward more pleasurable ones. Boredom, especially nowadays, can be replaced for distraction, and these distractions look like smartphones, cookies in cookie jars, the internet, TV, getting lost in our professional lives, errands, and the all too comforting fridge. However, self growth lies patiently in the boredom, in those unbearable states of consciousness, because it is only ourselves who label them as unbearable. Quote One measure of your depth of spiritual practice is this. Throughout what range of conditions do you remain aware of and relaxed as the bliss of your deepest being? The story of Jesus says his heart was wide open in love, even whilst being crucified. Tibetan monks in prison and Jews in concentration camps have reported deep compassion and spiritual openness while enduring the most excruciating tortures. Although it isn't necessarily pleasant to feel negative emotions, and that is obviously why we do all that we can to avoid feeling them or distracting ourselves from them when they arise, they too are aspects of the self. We live in a universe of polarity. The more we aim at the good, the more we will find the bad. That is why Bernard of Clairvaux, a French abbot, born 1090, said, quote, And dost thou strive perversively toward the north? The more thou dost hasten toward the heights, the more speedily shalt thou go down to thy setting. We suffer because we value one emotion over another. We think good is better than bad. We think sadness is worse than happiness. We pedestal certain feelings and states of consciousness, doing our best to incarcerate others, damning them to hell. What we have forgotten, however, is that the totality of who we are encompasses both the bad and the good, the darkness and the light. 
we cannot damn ourselves, or at least those aspects of the self we do not like, to hell. But we try to, day in, day out, and that is why we suffer. We don't like being afraid, so we do our best to avoid it. That is the same thing as saying that we don't like our left big toe, so we do our best to avoid it, hopping around whilst walking the dog or picking up groceries from the store. But we don't like our big toe. Walking becomes much harder. And we cannot hide from the truth. We have a big toe. It's right there, you see? Might as well learn to love that big toe and our left foot. 95% of what we do is unconscious. We, in this day and age, like to think we are fully autonomous beings, but we are not. We like to think that, because we have the internet and can talk about politics, morality, and molecules, that we are somehow separate from the animal kingdom, but we are not. We are animals through and through. Emotions regulate our interactions with the environment. They are the body's mode of communication with what it both consciously and unconsciously perceives. We cannot control them, just like we cannot control the sun or the moon, unfortunately, the world's leaders. What we can control, however, is how we respond to them. And we must learn to integrate emotional intelligence into our daily lives. If you are feeling angry, allow it, listen to it, respect it, then integrate it. Sign up for a boxing class or go work out with heavy metal music blasting into your ears. If you are feeling anxious, allow it, listen to it, respect it, then integrate it. Tell someone so they can validate you, see you and hear you, then calmly walk you through the necessary steps to face and transcend what you are afraid of or breathe and do it yourself. Ultimately, it is better to listen to our bodies, observe the thoughts and feelings that arise in everyday life remaining open to them without distracting ourselves from them, then asking ourselves why they might have arisen in the first place. If anger arises amidst a conversation with a loved one, do not validate it by defending your position, as I did in the car with my partner Siobhan. Instead, try to see it as a spiritual test, evidence that what your loved one said has exposed some rigidity or weakness in your ego. And because you are someone who wants to grow and learn, you can thank them for showing you where your next lesson lies. Relationships are a brilliant way to grow. If we can accept the fact that what we see out there is a reflection of what is within us, then we may view relationships as a vessel to cultivating greater self-awareness. And the parts we do not like in others are really only parts we do not like within ourselves, although we are unconscious to them, and that's part of the fun. Otherwise, hopefully, we'd have reconciled and integrated them by now. Nevertheless, by working on ourselves, we help those around us by providing a space for them to do the same. If we try to fix others or help them without their consent, we are really only giving their egos a platform to defend their positions, which also means that our egos stay the same too. That's why the Hindus follow the rule, quote, you ask, I teach. Only if someone asks, can we teach. Furthermore, who's to say we know any better than those we think we can help? We know the most about ourselves, and we should at the very least consider the same is true for others. In the turmoil of unconscious relationships, both egos need each other to survive. It is not so much a case of, if only he or she stopped pretending like they were the innocent victim in this relationship, then it would be wonderful, because the victim needs the perpetrator to survive, and vice versa. Just like right needs wrong so too does the narcissist require a defensive reactionary type, an opponent to heat up against the bullies, stabs, and passive aggressiveness. This is why relationships lost in karma cycles of pleasure and pain cannot survive if one of the partners decides to, by some bizarre stroke of enlightenment, simply give up being themselves. As Ram Dass wrote in his book, Be Here Now, quote, hippies need police just as police need hippies. Difficult relationships endure the tests of time purely because two people have become unconscious, deciding, unconsciously, to identify with their personas or egos. They'd, unconsciously, much prefer to suffer, longing and desiring for the good times, hating and resenting the bad times, going around and around and around. In The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle writes, quote, Relationships may seem perfect for a while, such as when you are in love, but invariably that apparent perfection gets disrupted as arguments, conflicts, dissatisfaction and emotional or even physical violence occur with increasing frequency. 
it seems that most love relationships become love-hate relationships before long. Love can then turn into savage attack, feelings of hostility, or complete withdrawal of affection at the flick of a switch, and this is considered normal. Was it really ever love, or was it, in fact, some kind of addiction to an intangible drug in disguise? We all know what love is. We've read about it a thousand times. Love is giving, serving, growing, helping, all acts void of scarcity. Yet we get lost in the relational cycles of pleasure and pain because we mistake pleasure for love, or as Tolly states, lowercase love for capital L-O-V-E. The pleasure and the neediness, what we mistake for love, cannot survive without the hate and the pain. We say to our partners such things as, you complete me, which is how Hollywood disguises attachment. We might then say, I'll never speak to you again, only to come crawling back in a few days or weeks, seemingly blinded by this new perspective or take on the relationship. Tolly continues, If in your relationships you experience both love and the opposite of love, attack, emotional violence, and so on, then it is likely that you are confusing ego attachment and addictive clinging with love. You cannot love your partner one moment and attack him or her the next. True love has no opposite. If your love has an opposite, then it is not love, but a strong ego need for a more complete and deeper sense of self, a need that the other person temporarily meets. It is the ego's substitute for salvation, and for a short time, it almost does feel like salvation. Put simply, as long as the relationship abstractly represents a circle, wheel, carousel, or merry-go-round, it isn't love. You're just going around and around. You're not actually getting anywhere. There's no growth. And this is because neither one of you can bear the thought of dying into yourself, relinquishing all attachment bonds to the ego, sustained only by the others. The only thing to do then, if you are well and truly fed up with being yourself, which is to say, sick of not getting anywhere in your relationship or other aspects of life, is to completely change your behavior. Love your partner even when he or she is acting as they always do. Flood them with conscious compassion when you know they are in an unconscious pattern. See through their ego walls even when it is the last thing you want to do, even when you'd much prefer to punch them or harness their weak spots for an incredible comeback or stab. Love through their walls of pain because, after all, it takes so much effort being yourself. Remember, your opinions aren't always right and neither are theirs. What should you do? Question your own opinions. You can help them question theirs, and they can help you question yours. You got a friend in me. With absolute unconditional love, it might be necessary to tell someone you love that you seriously cannot stand the way they're behaving, that they are acting like a child with the mental capacity of a peanut. If you said this in a manner of speaking with a radiant smile beaming into their very soul, chest wide open, exposing your beating heart with a cheeky grin, your inference is obvious. You are pulling them out of their less than acceptable funk they've managed to find themselves in. You want the absolute best for them because you absolutely love them and cherish your friendship together. You know that they are capable of great things and that, more importantly, they too want to achieve these great things. So, as their friend, stringent upon the necessities of honesty and social responsibility, you kindly, with love, support and humour, tell them to get the fuck to it. The humour part is important. As David Data says, most of us, quote, spend the majority of our lifetimes trapped in the seriousness of a game trying to win financially, sexually, emotionally, or spiritually, rather than relaxing as open being, living as the spontaneous flow of love, blessing all others with the gift of our deepest presence. It is important for each of us to approach our self-created suffering with great humour and compassion. We have created our opposition in order to express love in the form of a struggle to be free. But once we realize that our suffering is due to being lost in the game, we can relax open as the freedom of deep being. We can learn to enjoy the game and play it impeccably, not as an aggressive compulsion, but as our chosen expression of love. Humor is love. Calling your friend a peanut for behaving like a slobbering pig without any sense of integrity and ambition, evokes a sense of ease and humour, shedding light on the truth without destroying their very soul. They are your friend for a reason. 
The humor separates the truth that they should at least have a shower from the love that they are loved by you and the world and always will be. Quote, humor comes from the ability to see a situation from the outside and have perspective on it. Everything comes and goes. Everyone who lives dies. Everything that you feel is important. Your body, your family, humankind, the earth, the solar system passes. Ultimately, every situation is transient and unnecessary, regardless of how serious or real it seems when you are in it. Cosmic humor is to see the unnecessary nature of everything. One of the best medicines is laughter. This we know. All this talk of purpose, direction, fulfillment, and enlightenment in this day and age, albeit necessary every so often, can get tiresome. Having a sense of humor is ridiculously powerful and absolutely pivotal if we are to make it to the end of our lifetimes. We need to be able to laugh at ourselves. We need to step back and see the world for what it truly is. One giant game. Life can be very funny. What's not to laugh about a conscious species that has no idea what to do, where to go and what it all means? We are all as lost and insecure as each other. But rather than taking that too seriously, rather than getting lost in the seriousness of it all, why not appreciate the faults and imperfections as opposed to working tirelessly to transcend them? Yes, it is good to do and to achieve and work for greater outcomes, but enjoying the process is just as, if not more important. We'll get there, don't worry. Two halves make a whole. Ultimately, the best way to grow is to go out there and be in the world, saying yes to it all, simultaneously watching where, who, how, and when you feel resistance to it. Your resistance to life as it unfolds is your responsibility. You might feel anger, resentment, shame, or frustration to someone or something, a confrontation at work or significant event perhaps. Still, the resistance arises because you don't appear to like either consciously or unconsciously, the way the world is. The intensity of the pain depends upon your resistance to the present moment. If it happened, if she said that, then that's the way the world is. Your task then is to grow or learn to love it. As Ram Dass says, quote, Keep realizing that God is it all, and therefore everything you look at is part of Ram, God. Everyone you meet is Ram, who has come to teach you something. You are continually meeting and merging into perfection. Eventually, after years and years of attachment to karma cycles, enjoying being a someone on the hunt for more pleasure, enjoying the suffering even though you might complain about it, you come to realize that true liberation can only be found by giving up the need to get ahead. Then you realize that you're exactly where you want to be. You're exactly where you thought you'd get to by doing all those things and buying all that stuff and getting up early and staying up late. You're exactly where you always have been, even though you might have considered yourself a spiritual seeker on a quest for deeper truths. All your efforts to feel a greater sense of love and freedom were just distracting you from the here and now, which is infinitely free and loving. As Sufi the poet said, quote, on the hat of poverty, three renouncements are inscribed. Quit this world, quit the next world, quit quitting. So then it becomes about giving more freedom and love to others who might not see it yet and to yourself because you will undoubtedly fall asleep again from time to time. Just remember, never mistake love for pleasure. Love can be pleasurable, but pleasure isn't always lovely. 